Hey, what's up, folks? Welcome to another edition of The Winning Drive. I am Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers, joined by Lifetime Longhorn C.J. Vogel and the coach. He's a former high school coach at Burnett, uh, Brownwood, Capel, Rotan, also high, uh, was a uh, college football player at uh, Abilene Christian, was, was a coach there on multiple occasions as well, also was an analyst uh, over at the University of Texas, uh, was on that staff on multiple occasions as well, I believe five seasons on that staff, and now you can find his work at ShipleyRanches.com. It's Coach Bob Shipley. What's going on, Coach? Hey, what's happening, fellas? Oh, man, always fun. CJ, how you doing, brother? Hey, it's opening day. Uh, I hope that doesn't put you to sleep, Coach, but I'm excited. You know, we get a little baseball back in action now. Now, Coach, we know you don't talk basketball, but do you talk baseball? Baseball? <laughs> We're talking about baseball. I so, guess we got our answer. <laughs> all right, so, so are we talking about the Cardinals back in the day? Because I can talk about Cardinals back in the day. You talk about your team. You talking about your team, basically? Yeah, yeah but we're talking about back in the day. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Nowadays, I, I'm gonna sit here and do this while y'all talk uh, modern baseball. <laughs> I'll talk right. about the Cardinals anytime, unless it's 2011. Then I won't. All right. Then yeah. I'll, okay. Anytime I won't. Uh, I just got to get this out. Uh, CJ, uh, you a Rangers fan? That's right. Yeah, I figured that. All right, I'm an Astros fan, just for the record. So even though CJ and I get along. Uh, in that respect, we do not get along because uh, I'm, I'm a Ghost Rose guy. <laughs> but the Rangers, hey, I'll give you props, man. World Series champions, things to look it up for the Rangers, no doubt. That's That might be the best rivalry in sports right now other than, hell, I don't know, maybe Michigan, Ohio State, which is pretty damn juicy. Uh, all right, well, uh, enough baseball talk. Coach is in. Otherwise, Coach is going to tune us out. So let's get to some Texas football discussion. Thank you guys for joining us. Really appreciate you guys uh, joining us. Uh, hit us up with your chats, all your chats, all your super chats. Just throw them out there. Uh, the super chats, of course, we'll throw those out there. Interrupt the show at any time. But get your questions in uh, because we always love to answer those because it is a community. Love when you guys come on and join us uh, so we can talk Texas football. We also throw in some other discussion, too, which we'll, we might get into today. There are a couple of topics that I think are relevant to the Longhorns, but it's more of a macro conversation that I want to get into uh, coaches. And so we just talked about this uh, earlier today as uh, some NIL um, stories that I think are really, really topical. Uh, and there potentially could be a rule change uh, that will help, that will expand the uh, responsibilities and the roles of support staff. Uh, that's something that is being discussed. So we might get into that if we got some time. If not, we can take it for another day. Uh, all right. So uh, get your questions in, please. Get your super chats in. We, we'll get a recruiting update from my man CJ here really quickly. Uh, and we're also going to have another mini draft today. Are right, we going to have another mini draft? Uh, the last mini draft, well received. So we're going to do another mini draft. And I believe I end up losing the last mini draft based on the opinions of the people. I think I lost the last mini draft. So I'll try to perform a little bit better this time. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to do a mini draft about the players on the Texas roster who you want to see first coming off the bus. All right. Oh, yeah. they, look, they look the part, man. This is the guys that's going to intimidate just from this, just this sheer look of them when they walk it off the bus. Everybody's going to be like, holy Chicago, man, we might have a problem here. All right. So them dudes. So we're going to do it uh, five rounds again. Uh, CJ's going to be first. We already saw this before the show this time. It's about to be a little bit more professional. CJ's going to go first this time. Coach is going second. I'm going third. But we're going to snake it, though, guys. We're snaking it. All right, just like last time. So we can try to be a little bit more fair to me since I'm picking third. All right, so uh, we'll get into that a little bit later on in the show. Uh, before we do that, CJ, uh, is there any uh, recruiting news that the people need to know out there? Because I know the people out there, man, they they love the recruiting news. And in, nobody's as dialed in as you are, my man. Yeah, there's a, a couple of really interesting visitors coming in this week. And obviously the Texas Relays are in town. So you'll be seeing high schools, colleges, even professional track teams coming in and competing at the Mike A. Meyer Stadium right behind uh, DKR and splitting you know, the difference there between I-35 as well. So uh, a really busy four days coming up, starting today, ending uh, Sunday, or I guess Saturday, started yesterday, excuse me. Uh, but really interesting uh, uh, prospects coming in. I want to start with JV Osborne, the running back out of Forney, coming in. Uh, really, really talented player. He uh, has been all over Texas. Has visited the the campus a number of times. Was most recently on campus January twentieth for the Junior Day. That is JV Osborne. If you haven't watched his tape, go check it out. Twenty 
2,300 rushing yards last year, 39 rushing touchdowns. That's a kid that just puts up a lot of production, a lot of stats, a lot of touchdowns, finds the end zone very easily. For the 26th class, Kobe Sellers, the cornerback out of Shadow Creek, uh, one to really keep an eye on here. Uh, considered an Oklahoma lean early on, but as you know, Texas can flip that recruitment uh, as, as easily as anybody when they get them down to campus. Uh, that's going to be a big one here. He, again, visited January 20th for the junior day. Uh, candidate, again, to re return later on this spring, but getting him on campus, kind of in that smaller environment, one to know. Lamont Rogers, the 2025 offensive lineman out of Mesquite Horn, will be returning to Austin. He was actually in Austin last weekend for the All-22, kind of one of those uh, uh, branches of the Elite 11 uh, quarterback series that was in town last week at Westlake High School. He's in, in camp on town again uh, this weekend, this time meeting with Kyle Flood and the Texas staff. One other name I wanted to mention was uh, Jerry Meyer. Uh, the third. He's a quarterback out of Nevada who actually just is uh, moving down to Waxahachie this year. 2027 quarterback uh, will be visiting Texas this weekend. Hey, if you like if you like numbers, if you like touchdowns, if you like good passes, this might be a guy to keep a close eye on. Not the biggest frame, but just set the Nevada state record for touchdown passes in a single season with 58 while leading his team wow. to the two-way state classification uh, state championship. So that's a name to know. Moving down to the DFW area, we'll be co competing against some of the DFW's best 6A programs in the upcoming year. Uh, that's one to know. That's Jerry Meyer the third. Go check out his huddle. That's a kid that I, I, I checked out this morning for the first time, Rod. He can really, really scramble. And when he scrambles, he looks to throw. And I think that's very encouraging for a kid that young. You know, it, most times when you see, you know, that first sign of of issue in the pocket, it's time to hit the road and get as many yards as you can. Now, he goes laterally, he'll extend plays, and he's always looking to throw the ball down the field, which is what I love the most. So a really, really talented prospect with a long way to go. We'll see just how that recruitment develops, and it starts this weekend with a visit to Texas. Yeah, and Sark, that's what Sark looks for in a quarterback, too. He looks for a quarterback that is going to – uh, extend the play is going to run to throw first before scrambling. Scrambling will be the last possible option, even though Quinn Ewers, I think this season, this past season, scrambled a little bit more uh, than being letting to be the last option. But I do think that's what Sark likes in his quarterbacks, and he encourages them, hey, stick with it, extend the play so you can look downfield and get deeper into your progressions and hit some of those vertical routes down the field. So if that young man's already doing that, he's ahead of the game. I remember asking Trey Owens, what he was working on in his last season in high school. And he said, I'm working on my mobility, uh, my mm -hmm. ability to extend plays, get outside the pocket, uh, maneuver in the pocket, and then be able to make those those throws down the field after I extend the plays. So uh, the second reaction plays, if you will. Uh, so that's really important. I'm glad that the young man's already working on that. Uh, that's something nice to observe. I mean, CJ always in the know when it comes to recruiting. Um, all right, so we'll uh, get to your questions. Like I said, hit us up. We uh, I promise we'll get to those, uh, as many of them as we can. So keep them coming. Throw out the super chats as well. Uh, I want to ask you guys, before we get to the uh, the super uh, mini draft here, uh, I want to ask you about some questions really about uh, spring practice and really just about this this team overall. Um, after, uh, what are we, are we five or six practices in? Something like that, CJ? Five practices in. Friday will be your sixth. That'll also be your third in pads. So yeah. Yeah, cruising along here. April 20th is coming on. right on up. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and it, it, Obviously, really early on, um, but who do you think uh, right now has um, kind of gained the most momentum? Who is trending the most right now early on in spring practice? Uh, I mean, that's it's it, 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 obviously, like I said, they got a long way to go. But you've been around uh, the team now, had a couple of media availabilities, media windows, I should say, and media availabilities, CJ. Um, have you talking to folks, watching this team, watching them and watching different players? Who do you think is trending? right now after five days. Yeah, it's hard not to look at Nato Umiozulu as a guy that's really making noise. Wow. You know, for the last two practices, he's been with your first team unit on the offensive line at left guard. That's quite a surprise. You know, it was a big spring for him coming in. Would he be able to take the reins and kind of leap Hayden Connor in that re that regard uh, to make the starting five? He really turned it on the last half of practice last uh, last fall. Had a great month leading up to the Washington Bowl game. Now that you've had an extra two or three months in the weight room, you've kind of changed your body again a little bit. Can you supplant 
you know, Hayden Connor and take over that left guard spot. Hayden Connor, again, second straight day that we were able to watch on Wednesday. Uh, he was working with the second team offensive line at center. So a little bit of a switch up there. Cole Hudson, second team left guard, getting first team reps in and out with Nato Umiozulu as well. So it, it's just Kyle Flood kind of using yeah. that opportunity to cross train across the entire offensive line. I'll tell you what, the other guy that I wanted to mention was DeAndre Moore. This is a guy that has really shown to me that this means something to him. And it, it it's easy to look back and say, you know what? These kids play college football. They're now getting paid to play college football. This should, it should matter to everybody. Well, and coach, you can probably back me up here. When a wide receiver is showing up to practice 30 minutes early to get work on the jugs and, and talk to coaches about routes, it means a little bit extra whenever you see that. And he's been that guy that's shown up early. He's always been the first guy to practice that we've seen. So I, I've certainly noticed that from him. On the defensive side, Colton Vosick, just getting to see what he can do healthy. Uh, I mean, 6'6", 255 plus. Getting to watch him bend is a little differently. You get an idea of it with Ethan Burke right now, but I think there's a little bit higher of a ceiling with Colton Vosick when you talk about his athleticism off the edge. It's it, I, I'm hoping he can stay healthy. That way you can see him on the field as a contributor this year because that edge room, nasty. A lot of contributors now, a lot of talent there. If he can carve out a role, I think you're going to look at something very special down the road with Colton Vosick. Yeah. Uh, I'll add uh, Trey Moore to the mix too. I feel like – He's been trending. I feel like I'm hearing something about him after uh, all the practice, especially the ones where the media can see him. And he doesn't necessarily look like those other defensive ends, but you can tell. I mean, he's 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 the guy that may end up with the most overall splash plays with that group because of his uh, skill set. He's just a guy that's got explosivity. BGO first step is great. Uh, oh, can you throw up that uh, Justin Calhoun comment really quickly for us, Matthew? That's great, Coach. How about this? Coach Shipley is coaching my daughter today at a track meet. Hey, coach, you go, you pull a double duty. What's going on? Well, no, not this coach Shipley. <laughs> that apparently is some other coach Shipley. There's a lot of coaches. Yes. <laughs> hey, coach, that doesn't look like a track meet behind you. It thanks you're not this coach Shipley <laughs> sitting in Abilene, Texas, in my in my living room with my little Longhorn. See. <laughs> no, it ain't me. I know you said you was busy today, Coach. You had some stuff to do, so uh, I know you was that busy. running out, coaching track. Uh, and then... <laughs> I've been out mowing the yard. It ain't it, it ain't me. It ain't you. All right, there you go. Well, Justin, uh, I don't. Hey, whichever the Shipleys you got, if they if they in the Shipley family, you got a good one. All right, you can trust them. If this if it's a Shipley, that's a name you can trust. All right, there you go. That's what ShipleyRanchers.com. Put it on the put it on a t shirt, Coach. It's a name you can trust. All right, <laughs> let's get uh, back to it. I want to ask you guys uh, just a random question here before we uh, get to the uh, the mini draft, because I think I'm, I'm getting excited about the mini draft already. Uh, and for those who have just joined us, we'll explain the mini draft. Get your questions in. We'll throw those out there as well. I already see one that I'm a little bit uh, excited to answer here. Uh, so in the chat, so go get the questions in, get the super chats in. Uh, let me ask you this. Is, is there a chance – that Texas has, like they did last season, is there a chance Texas has an elite position group like the interior D tackles were, where they were the best D tackle duo in the country? Now look at the wide receiver duo of A.D. Mitchell and Xavier Worthy seems like now in retrospect even more of an elite duo. I mean, there are a lot of those. Washington had two and hell, LSU. Now LSU going to have two drafted in top ten. So LSU had two of them. So I'm not saying they were the best wide receiving duo in the in college football, but they were among the, the best top five. Uh, does Texas have position groups that are top five worthy, top five esque? Coach, I'll start with you. Do you think there's a position group that you would throw Texas out there against any position group in the country and say, "Oh no, I, I bet Texas can compete with any group in the country at this position." Well, it's, it is a little bit early, I think, but um, from looking at the film of our wide receiver transfers, uh, I, I don't know that, you know, I, I don't know how much of a drop-off we'll have with our wide receivers in 24. We've got some incredible transfers in, and not only wide receiver, but as Rod and I discussed this evening in our uh, football theory I, I think maybe um, 
I think maybe we've got, you know, uh, some depth at wide receiver uh, that, that we've had in the past, but now it's, it's you know, it's a lot of new names, all, along with some, you know, John Tay and some others, you know, that we have in the mix. But uh, I think our wide receiver, our offensive line, and potentially our, you know, our, our defensive front, I, you know, I think we've got some guys that can, that can really make some noise in those spots. Yeah. Yeah, the offensive line to me, I think you could certainly consider it to be in that conversation. You know, they were semifinalists for the Joe Moore Award last year, and for the most part, you return everybody aside from Christian Jones. What will happen at left guard, as we mentioned earlier, we'll see. But you have two five-star guys on that offensive line starting right now, DJ Campbell, Cam, uh, Kelvin Banks. You have a guy with Jake Majors with plenty of experience at your center position. Now you're having a guy walk in with Nato Umuzulu who's pushing what was a two-and-a-half-year starter and Hayden Connor out of the rotation right now. So that, to me, and it, it obviously looks a little different, too. When you go by at practice and you watch these guys, they look much different than where this unit was when Sarkeesian and Flood originally arrived. That's encouraging because, again, Rod, you've talked about it, too. You've not seen anybody hit the portal that you were expecting to contribute in their career at the no. offensive line at Texas. So that is certainly encouraging to me. The depth is there. The talent is there. And if you can repeat what you did last year and maybe even take a step up, that unit should be, again, in that conversation for being the best offensive line come the end of next season. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I think the only other group I'll throw out there is quarterback. Yeah, yeah, so that's quarterback. a good point. It's uh, it, you know, he's in that conversation, right? It's like him and Shadur Sanders and Carson Beck. He should, he should be there uh, at the end of the season uh, in that conversation for one of the elite quarterbacks in the country. All right, uh, good conversation there. Uh, before we get to the oh, how about this? <laughs> Coach McCotton says Coach Shipley is a staple of what is right in Texas. Hook him. Well, yep, you damn right. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Hey, any of them ship? I know you got a lot of grandkids, Coach. So. Hey, we'll, them Shipleys, we'll take them over there in Texas. They can run. If they can run and they can catch. You know, like they go, they, they easily can come over and contribute on the four acres any day. Yeah, we're, we're, we're a few years away from that, a decade <laughs> or so away from that. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, no doubt. But, I, hey, I know y'all working on them over there, no, no question. All right, before we get to the mini draft, before we get back to your questions, um, we got. We have to give a, a shout out to our wonderful sponsor uh, for here. We have a great sponsor for the winning drive, the championship winning drive, Flat Creek Estate Wine. Uh, Flat Creek Estate Winery is raking in the awards, folks. Eleven of them in thirty days, including double gold, Grand Reserve, and Texas Grand Reserve at the Houston Rodeo. Five-time award winner at the San Francisco International Wine Competition, just right outside of Austin. The beautiful Flat Creek Estate is also hosting events for the whole family all spring. Celebrate Easter with live music and an egg hunt. Take in the, the Eclipse with a bottle in hand. And their winemaker's dinner on April 11th is the perfect date night event. Eat, drink, and be awesome at Flat Creek Estate. For more info, visit flatcreekestate.com. That's flatcreekestate.com. Uh, yes, and I can guarantee you that whenever me and wifey get a babysitter that we will be visiting Flat Creek Estate Winery. All right. <laughs> I will already give me some brownie points for that because uh, my wife loves going to uh, wineries and um, I'm hearing great things about Flat Creek Estate. Uh, so we appreciate their support. Uh, all right, gentlemen. Um, hey, Rod, I got, I got something well, for you real quick. Can we bring up that comment by Band Performance down there at the secondary? Uh, shout out my guy, Bernard Blake, you know, Band Performance. He's hey. that's, that's the, the DB guru down here in Austin. Training he is, man. That's Michael uh, Taffy, uh, Jade Barron, Andrew McCuba. That's If you all want to applaud somebody in the chat right now, that's the guy that's getting this Texas secondary right behind the scenes. That's what's up. Uh, working with these guys. Again, when you talk about – the strength of this team and where it could be defensively, Rod, I'll, let, I'll leave you to it. But that's the group back there that you're all excited about. Uh, I have been. I said, if it's not a strength this year, I would be very disappointed. Um, yeah. It's it, talk about a group that is trending in the right direction. First of all, you bring back today, Baron. 
We all know Jade Barron, extremely high football IQ, got versatility, can move this guy around, put him out at corner. Um, I think even he can play safety if you need him to. Makuba's got the same type of versatility. Uh, he's a guy that's got veteran experience, played at the highest levels. He's coming in to, to infuse some more secondary, uh, some more versatility into that secondary. And then you got the guys outside, whether you're talking about Terrence Brooks, talking about Malik Muhammad, um, some of the, the Gavin Holmes, I'll throw him in the mix too. Now these guys have been in the system long enough. They're, they they should feel more confident about the muscle memory in the system, knowing exactly what technique they play with what coverage. Uh, they should be past the, the growing pains phase of, uh, of of acclimating to this system. So I expect those guys to go out there and make some plays. I expect the corners to be able to play man-to-man coverage, press man coverage, all right, using proper leverage. Uh, and I, the safeties should also be a strength. I mean, that should be leadership from that yeah. safety group this year, especially with a guy like Makuba playing safety and Michael Taft, Taft Daddy. We've talked about that multiple times, how you can't keep Taft Daddy off the field because alignment assignment is always in the right place. But now he's displaying leadership. He's one of those guys now where I think everybody's kind of a he's, he's earned respect among his teammates because of his journey. As coach, you can talk about this, though, the journey to, from a walk on to be a starter uh, and a guy who's getting starting reps at the University of Texas is that is a, a road that is, is, is less traveled and is less traveled for a reason because most people just don't have the fortitude to do it. They don't have the skill, number one, to do it, and they don't have the patience for it uh, and the football character for it. Michael Taft's got all those different things, and that's on display when he can go up against the guys who are – Blue chip recruits, not saying that guy couldn't have gone somewhere and played uh, and gotten a scholarship. He could have. He wanted to play at Texas, but he had to earn that scholarship as a walk on and then earn not only the scholarship, but earn reps on the field and earn the trust of the, the coaches, but also the respect of his teammates. Because when you watch somebody uh, earn their way all the way to, to, to starter reps on the field from a walk on situation, that I mean, I think everybody in that uh, locker room understands uh, the, that journey and they respect it more. And it makes you look yourself in the mirror and wonder if you're working hard enough. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 I expect my in short. I know that wasn't short, um, but I think the secondary is going to be a strength. Like I said, and if they're not, if it's not, then hey, man, I'll eat that crow. I'll put yeah. some hot sauce on it and I'll eat that. Yeah, crow. I, I, I really feel like, um, you know, when you look at Michael Taft and um, you know, our secondary, he's a guy much like um, Gunnar Helms, who is going to have people nipping at him for playing time. You know, whether they can overtake him or not, I don't know. He reminds me of a Blake Gideon. I know you say, okay, well, he's a white safety. I know. That's <laughs> no, but he's in the right place at the right time. You know, he's in the right place at the right time. He's got people nipping his heels all the time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Blake Gideon, Blake Gideon was an incredible competitor who always seemed to be at the right place at the right time. Michael Tapp is another guy who seemed to have that ability to be at the right place at the right time. But if, look, if I'm looking at somebody on offense and somebody on defense that has people nip, you know, nipping at their heels for playing time, yeah. I think it's Gunnar Helms and – you know, I think it's Michael Taft, those guys. And as, as Rod and I were talking about earlier today when we were visiting, when, when, you know, when you look at those guys, if they're starters, Gunnar Helms and Michael Taft, then you know that they've really, up, you know, continued to develop as players. Yep. You know, we've got people that are maybe perhaps more athletic. Yep. Um, but those guys just seem to have a way, you know, when you look at Gunnar Helms, he, you know, he, he seems to find a way to get open. Whether he can handle what we're asking of a tight end, you know, uh, blocking and so forth, you know, that, that remains to be seen. But, uh, you know, those are two guys I see that, that have people, you know, like I said, pushing them for playing time. But if those guys continue to develop, then um, – you know, we're, we're going to be, we're going to have some pretty good depth there. Okay. So coach opened the door. So I got a quick little mini rant here. Okay. okay. Cause Longhorn fans, they do have a tendency to be overly critical of our white safeties that end up starting at sexes. They do. All right. Y'all still talking about Blake Gideon dropping the possible interception versus Texas tech, but ain't nobody getting no Earl Thomas 
and 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 Curtis Brown over there when they were double teaming Crabtree and yet gave up the touchdown. Nobody, nobody, Good y'all point. don't hold right. No, nobody's holding that same type of grudge, right? And Blake Gideon started more games than any, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and you go look at my man Dylan Haynes. Oh man, y'all, Dylan Haynes, y'all talk so much trash on Dylan Haynes. Y'all know y'all did. And Dylan Haynes is like top five all time in interceptions at Texas, top five. And yet, if Lo- you ask Logan fans, they'd be like, ah, he's a scrub. Oh man, he's trash. And I'm he's like, a walk on. he's a walk on. <laughs> he's a, yeah. um, and, and, and and honestly, look, oh, British schooler. It's British schooler. It, the guy's playing in the league right now. Yeah, long yeah. Oh man, he's a bitch British schooler, man. He can't play. Get him out of there. Y'all will admit, I'm saying it's something going on, but y'all are a little overly critical of our white safeties. And I think Taft Daddy did some of the deals deals with some of that same stuff. But it's all right. We can talk about this because we're a family. You know what I mean? It's all good. All hey, right. yeah. well, like you and I were talking about <laughs> earlier today, Rod, if if Taff is a starting safety, then we're going to be a really, really good football team. He's got a lot of good people nipping at him. And if he can continue to develop the way that he has, then we're going to be all right. And yeah. and same and, and the same way with Gunnar Helms at tight end. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's got people nipping him. I don't know he if, if he is the uh, you know as complete overall a tight end as uh, Sanders, but you know he's got he's got some things going for him, but he's got a lot of people nipping his tails too. So we'll, you know his heels. We'll see what happens with that. Yeah, uh, and when I said DBU, I meant DBs. He started more games than any DB. At Texas, yeah, at Texas. yeah, that's what I mean. yeah. Um, but that is that is actually a factor. I mean, uh, my man Coach Akin used to always share that with me. Okay, let's get to yeah, we and we'll get to some questions too. I saw those questions piling up, so we appreciate those. Keep them coming. But I want to uh get to and shout out to Bam Performance Man for uh, for coming through. I'm a fan too. Follow uh, the work on Twitter. Love the work he does with the with the young people in the in the community, but also uh, with them Texas DBs and the guys on the next level, man. So I'm a fan as well. Uh, okay. All right, so let's get to our mini draft for those who have not who have not uh heard of our mini draft before we've done one other mini draft before uh the mini draft is essentially five rounds it's a snake draft and in the uh, mini draft this one is going to be the first players off the bus the guys that you think would intimidate the opposing team the most just by the sheer look of them walking off the bus all right yeah, that, that's that's what we're going for here right those are the guys so that is what the draft will be focused on I believe CJ will get the first pick. We already settled this beforehand. CJ is going to get the first pick. Coach will get the second pick, and I'll get the third pick, but it'll be a snake draft. Uh, so I'll get the second. I mean, so I get the third and the fourth pick, and then we'll go backwards. Uh, coach, and then we'll go to CJ, and then come back again. That's how the snake draft works. All right, so the focus is first players off the bus. Who's got the best look to them that will intimidate your opponent? All right, CJ, uh, you going first here. Who's first off the board in our first off the bus player draft off the Texas roster? You know, it, it would have been fun to have this conversation last year because you would have had a number of guys. I think Byron Murphy probably would have been that one point oh, yeah. one guy. Yep. And also for future drafts that we have, we got to start keeping a little a little standings between the three of us. <laughs> uh, that little you, the, the community poll we put up, I think favored me just a little bit. So I'm okay. gonna have to, uh, nudge at you guys. You know, I like it. Just I a like little it. bit. We got to have some fun with these. I'm here. down with. It. I'm down with. It. Okay, let's do that. Hey, hey. CJ won the first one. We'll get you on that. <laughs> one point one. I'm going DJ Campbell. This That's is a guy cool. you don't want to mess with. He's a brick house. Uh, you know, six, three and a half, 325, 330 pounds. The dude can really move some weight on the interior of that offensive line. I would not want to mess with them. He has that athleticism that those clips that you've seen in high school, he can run through you and he's got the swag to back it up. He's going to be juiced up, you know, looking like he's that guy off the bus. Yeah, I want him. He's kind of got that mean look to him, that bulldog look that Byron Murphy had as well. Yes. DJ Campbell's joining Team CJ here. I like that. That's good. That's a good pick. That's quality. Coach, you up yeah. next. That's a good pick. Yeah, I gotta go with I gotta go with my man Kelvin Banks. Good, good, uh, good pick. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to have to go up that front of I don't want to have to go up in front of that guy in reality or in dreamland <laughs> or whatever it is. I I don't want to go up against Kelvin Banks. He's my first pick off the bus. 
Oh, that's good. I like the way y'all going. Okay, got got the old line being represented here. Oh man, you know what? I'm gonna go defense off the board then, since y'all going offense. I'm gonna go Alfred Collins yeah, off the bus, baby. Yeah. Off the bus. He's my he's first of uh, first pick for us off the bus team, man. He's got the look to him. I'm talking about six five. 321. I mean, this dude, and we all know if he puts it all together, this guy could be talking about being drafted in the early rounds. He's got that kind of frame. He's got things you just cannot teach. And the things he, that you cannot teach with Alfred Collins will scare the hell out of any opponent. So they'll be like, man, who the hell is that dude? What number is he? Uh, so Alfred Collins, I'm taking with that pick, the number three overall pick. All right. So I'm going back to back here, right? Back yep. to back. Here we go, guys. I'm going to go. Oh, this is easy. This is easy. How about we go? With Big Cam Williams, baby. Let's go with Big Cam. Yeah, Big Cam Williams. I got to go defense and offense. I'm going to mix it up a little bit. There you go. Boom. Coming off the bus. Big Cam Williams and with Alvin Collins. Hey, Rod, at 6'6", 360, it's hard not to like that. I'm surp- I mean, at, at pick number Man. four, that's great value. Exactly. <laughs> Could have easily been a first rounder. I don't know why we just let him slip like that. But, <laughs> hey, I'll take the value, baby. I'll take Absolutely. it. Absolutely. What do you got, Coach? All right, I got Anthony Hill Jr. Oh, so, that was going to be my sleeper. <laughs> CJ, find you out of the pick. I got your pick. <laughs> you you took it right you. under me. That's yeah. a great pick. That yeah, is a great, a great pick. pick. Damn it. All right. I, I'm going to go to the defensive line because we see these photos every year of what the work Tory Beckton and his staff does to these guys. Oh. Uh, and this is one that – that I like a lot, and it, he surprised me last year. Starts on the defensive line. Give me Baron Sorrell. He's Ooh. got that look to him. He's Jack, got the strong arms. I, I like the size of him. Give me Baron Sorrell. That's pick number two for me. And I'm going to hmm. go to a DB. I'm going to get the first looking guy that you know doesn't have that big weight to him. Oh, come on! I'm, I hope I'm taking your guy, Rock. You are. I know you are. I know you are. I'm going Terrence Brooks. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good was one. That, was that who you were thinking here? That's one of them. I had a couple of DVs on my big board, baby. A couple of them. That's yeah. one of them. I'll cross okay. them off. I like that. I like Terrence Brooks a lot. Okay. All right. Coach? Coach, it's up to you. It's up to me. I'm back. You back, baby. All right. So, okay, Rod, you take Vernon? No, I took Alfred Collins and Cam Williams. I'm taking Vernon Broughton, babe. That was – oh, man. Yes, sir. Yeah, that was, that was actually – Yeah, hey. I got to tell you, y'all uh, y'all been reading my mind, man. That's that's how I know great minds think alike. You got to bow your head and respect that dude when he gets off the bus. <laughs> oh, that's a good – okay, I like that. I like An that. elder statesman at that, too. He's been around the block. Yeah. All right, Rod. Pick number three and pick number four. I gotta write this that could off. go a number of ways. Really <clears throat> throw us off here. Okay. Well, one of these is going to be really easy. I'm just going to go. I mean, I can't believe he's still on the board. I, just, I feel lucky. I feel blessed. Uh, we're going Ethan Burke here. Yep. I mean, 6'6", six, six, you know, 250, walking the, yep. you know, the mechanic, as Coach calls him, walking off the bus there. He's got a mean look to him. Looks like he's about his business. Uh, you don't want to mess with that dude, man. So I'm going to go Ethan Burke. I mean, he's, he's a hell of a player. So I like that. I feel good about that pick. That's just a tremendous value. Um, and you know what? I got to tell you, I might throw, throw folks off on this one. Might go a little bit different here. Um, all right. I feel like I, I feel like I need some more representation with some more skill here. But coming off the bus, man, I wonder who a skill guy could actually intimidate a little bit. That's the thing. That's what we got to look at. Um, all right, you know what to hell with that. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, Peyton Kirkland. How about that? Off the okay. board. 6'6", 366, baby. Big man. The Boom. Big How about boy. that? Big boy. How about that? Hey, you coach, go. you're going for or, uh, Rod. You're going for the bodyguards here. Can I'm just going for Kirkland. Yeah, I'm just going for you, big dogs. To get the specialized bus to get them off. I mean, yeah, those going, are, yeah, man. We're going for mass. We just want we going mass. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a scary tactic. I like it. All right, coach. I want you. Okay, he may, he may not be the most intimidating person getting off the bus, but once you see his face, and more importantly, possibly the mullet, is Quinn Ewers. 
He gets uh, off the bus. He gets off the bus. You know, we're all about business. It's all about business. Man, Quinn getting off the bus, he, you know, his size is not really going to, you know, make a lot of people shake, but his stats will. I'm going with Quinn. Okay. That's a good one. You know who he is. Damn right. Damn that's, right. A, that's a good one. You can't, I, I can't knock that pick. It's amazing this guy's fallen this far. And I've fallen victim to not picking him three times, but it's not going to happen a fourth time. And Jeff Cook just mentioned it in the chat. Uh oh. It's the linebacker from Alabama. We're going Kendrick Blackshear. This was a guy, yeah. you got to see this guy out of high school at Duncanville. I mean, he looked like he had been in the NFL for probably six years. It's unbelievable. <laughs> The genetics this guy has. I, I saw him in a wife beater walking around at a seven on seven tournament, <laughs> thinking this guy was a, a, a you know battling for all the the Mister World competition. You know the, the world's strongest man. So that's where I'm going at number four. Ooh, I like that. And that's I want nice. to go with Nato Umiozulu at number five. I Ooh. like that guy a lot. Again, he's got that mean streak to him, and if that's the goal of this, is to intimidate the opposing team. That's NATO's it. my guy because I know he's not going to back down from nothing, and that's why you're starting to see him a little bit in that first team offensive line. I like that. All right, that's good. That's a nice team. That's a nice team coming off the bus. I like that. That's that's a mean team, Coach. What you got? I like I, Coach shook it, shook it up a little bit with the Quinn Ewers pick. He sure uh, did. I like it. Come on, Coach. Yeah. Give me, some. Okay. Give me another shake up. So if you like Quinn Ewers. And you understand who he is when he gets off the bus. You gotta love my man CJ Baxter when he gets <laughs> off the bus. He's gonna be toting the mail, toting the, <laughs> uh, toting the rock. Yeah, <laughs> he he may not be the biggest guy off the bus. He gets on the bus. You if you don't know who he is, you will after a couple of handoffs. I like it. Absolutely, you're gonna know who CJ Baxter is by the end of a game. That's for sure. Yeah, no, that's good, coach. You're right. And he likes to be like running between the tackles, man, and lean on you. That's a good one. Yep. That is yep, a good yep. One. Quality pick, coach. Quality pick. Um, all right. Coming off the bus here. Last pick of the draft. This is interesting. Could go a number of different ways here. Um, okay. You know what? I I don't know how it ended up this way, but I think I'm gonna be representing. Uh, representing that Westlake, I'm going to go Colton Vossett. Yeah, coming off the bus, looking good, man. 6'5", 250. I just kind of like the frames of these guys. I don't know what it is. I should be throwing up the W or something right now. So there you go. I'll go with the, the two Westlake edges on there, man. As you go. That's, that's pretty nice. Colton, uh, there you go. I like that. I, I don't hate that. I, you got a tie fraud. You got the big boys off of, uh, you know, Cam Williams and Peyton Kirkland and you – you know, you go right back at it with the with hey. the twin towers of havoc is what they called them at a, at Westlake with Ethan okay. Burke and Colton Fossick. So I like uh, that. Uh -huh. You know, they can they can rock. That's fun. Hey, you know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to get that Westlake vote on that poll. You know what I mean? Yeah. Put that poll out there. Get that Westlake vote, man. You know they 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 they, they real they they they're real uh, adamant adamant fans, man. They're they're really committed fans. I'm trying to get that group. Uh, so was that Arch Manning with his shirt off. All right, I was gonna go Arch when Coach shook it up. That's what I was debating between was going with Arch. I was like, you know, because Arch off the bus, that's pretty damn intimidating. A Manny coming off the bus, man. That's right. <laughs> I would, he came his shirt on, but a Manny off the bus, you were like, oh, man, that's wild. Yeah, somebody said we're sleeping on Sadir Mitchell. You're right. We should have probably threw Sadir Mitchell out there. So Mitchell, Sadir huh. Mitchell, for some reason, I guess people think his stock is 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 down during spring ball or something. But you're right. Sadir probably should have been the draft. There you go. Hey, yeah. what, do you, what do you think of Kyle here? We should have picked Burt. <laughs> Little bit of Auburn action coming off the bus. Hey, first. Hey, working, you know, hey, now hang on. We ain't working at Supercuts. Right? <laughs> this ain't for Supercuts get off the bus pick. No, I'll tell you why this 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 actually is right. This is actually makes sense, Kyle. Because Bird Aubin is a little weird and eccentric, a little crazy looking, right, with the hair. And he might be wearing one of those weird suits, something strange like he was wearing. What game was that? Was that the Texas Tech game? He came out wearing the weird suit. All right. And I've talked to Bird Aubin. Bert Auburn is a bit uh, eccentric, right? He is, and, and most kickers are. They're kickers for you. They're like the drummers of the team, right? They're just kind of weird people. And sometimes you don't you don't want to fight. You don't want to get in a fight with weird man. 
because especially when weird it like that dude is hanging out with a lot of big dudes hey man he might be crazy he might be wild you never know what to expect from a dude like bird arvin so that's why picking a bird arvin coming off the bus it will make you wonder like man what's up with this dude man to watch my back around this dude yeah no on? as tom Herman would say you took the you you took a kicker <laughs> You know what? Hey, if I'm thinking of you know kickers being intimidating, walking off the bus, they just got to stick that one leg out, and that's it. You know, if you saw Justin Tucker coming, and he just leaves his, he takes that first step off the bus, but the rest of the body stays up in the on the steps. That's all I got to see is the feet and the leg, and I'm thinking, oh boy, I, they're not missing a kick today, so that's that's not a bad pick, uh, Rod. Coach, I wanted to ask you guys because I mean, I think we both looking at these lists right now. We got some. We got a scary unit across the board here. Who did we miss? I keep seeing Savion on red. Yeah, I thought Trevor Gooseby might go six eight, yeah. three fifteen, yeah. three twenty in that range. Another right. offensive lineman who you know you, you can't teach six eight. Uh, Colin Simmons, Xavier Philsome, a couple of young guys. Uh, anybody that come to mind for y'all that you know maybe we missed on here? I, Alex January is somebody I thought about throwing yeah. out there. Young Alex January was a was one of the guys I thought about. So he's one I think we missed. I mean, that's I, that's how intimidating this group is. I mean, did anybody pick Zena Omiyazulu? No, he's a good one though. He's a good one too. Um, hell, I mean, so I, I I'm with you. I think they got a lot of guys that that fit the hey let let them be the first guy off the bus. <laughs> they got a bunch of them because that's that's what Sark wants, right? Big humans. They're recruiting long, rangy guys. Someone said Big Red Stro. What's David somebody Bender. Yeah, Conestro, 6'7", 370. No, no David Bender. Bender's been, Bender's been building it up, man. Build, Bender looks like he spent some time behind bars, actually. He kind of, <laughs> that kind of swole up. Uh, he does. So you're right about that, man. Um, so that, that hair will have you shaking. Yeah, I mean, Bert Arvin, if Bert, if Bert Arvin and I got into a dispute, I would wonder whether I could take him or not because I'd be wondering, like, what? Why is this dude, you know, why this little old dude with the crazy hair and the crazy suit on, why is he stepping up to me like this? Why is he stepping up? So hey, maybe we'll anybody got a kicker or punter on their list getting off the bus? Hey, man. <laughs> Done? They already out? I don't got to tell you what team you're on. You ain't, <laughs> hey, you ain't batting from the wrong, from the right side of the plate. That's all I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, them kickers, they got time to, to lift weights all the time, coach. They can hey, get upper body real swole. They got room for no kicker punter on my team. Hey, hey you know, somebody we might have missed though, Jelani McDonald probably should have been on there. Jelani McDonald. CB looks with good. Jamon Tapp is a good pick as well. That's a guy that that is, you know, he's from Louisiana. He's from the boot. You know, I I went with Baron Sorrell, the other DE from the boot. Jamon yeah. Tapp's a good pick there as well. No, I like that. All right. Uh, good stuff there. Good conversation. Uh, appreciate all you guys' participation as well. Uh, and we'll get to uh, some of the questions here as well. But uh, I put, I think we're going to put that up. We'll see who won. We'll start keeping track of it. I know CJ wants to keep track who's winning the drafts. So we'll keep track. I think CJ won the last draft based on the, 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 the public poll that we put up. So that's how we'll pick the winners. Basically, the people will pick the winners. So we're supposed to be a show of the people. So the YouTube poll is already up there. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, always doing a great job for us. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll determine that later on. How long does the, the YouTube poll last? Is it a day? Is it 24 hours? And then we'll know who the champion is of this thing? Or is it just throughout the show? Hey, we'll bring it up on Monday, but uh, it'll right. last through a, a couple days, I think. All right. So now you got me one, actually wanting to compete. Now CJ to change the dynamic of this thing. It's supposed to be friendly. And now no, CJ, we're getting competitive uh, you know, out here, Rod. Come on. That's true. Hey, I already know. That coach Coach wants to compete, too. Trust me. Hey, hey coach, I, I, I saw Drew Kelson's name. Drew Kelson came in. He come, I'm telling Drew Kelson ain't going to vote for no kicker, punter. I promise you that. <laughs> that dude was a hit man. Drew Kelson coming out of high school was a hit man. <laughs> hey, that's not, hey, there you go. Houston Lamar, baby. Mm -hmm. Represent, baby. That DB, oh, DB yeah. high. DB high all the time. I like that. Um, all right. So <laughs> Ashley Harrington says Clark Wang uh, shorts. Is that what it is? Huh? I can't read the emoji. I'm too old for it. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, all right. Uh, let's get to the question here. There's a question here by Tyrese uh, Barmer that I think is interesting. Is for me. Uh, says, Rod, is Junior Seau 
a good comp for Hill. Say I was a 6'3", 250-pound linebacker who played outside before moving inside, a great pass rusher, disruptor, and sideline to sideline tackler. Oh, man. Yeah, Anthony Hill's about, what, 6'3", 240, 245, somewhere in there. I I don't know if their play style is the same. Now you got me wanting to go back and look at some Junior Seau film. I don't know if their play – right? I mean, Junior Seau was an unbelievable player. Um, but maybe you're right about that. Maybe when Anthony Hill is fully realized, when he is fully weaponized as a player, maybe that maybe we will see some of that because you're right. Say I was all over the field. It felt like mm-hmm. it felt like he was everywhere all at once. Right? That's that that's that movie that won the uh, the Oscar for Best Picture. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Like that's <laughs> what it felt. That's what Junior Seau's game felt like. It's all over the field. And so I haven't seen that from Anthony Hill just yet. But I, and just in terms of Tyrese, you're talking about the upside and the ceiling. Yeah, maybe you're right about that. That terms of him, that being the ceiling for a guy. And honestly, that's how where I would want him to be. I'd want him uh, fully weaponized to the point where he can affect the game from sideline to sideline. And I, I think Will Muschamp had a great saying. He'd always say, you know, thoroughbreds don't go backwards. And he's a thoroughbred, so you want him going upfield, disrupting as much as possible. And you want him going sideline to sideline. And he would always say, basically, when when they got a guy like that backing up, then they already won. And that's kind of remember. I think Lohan fans were mad about that when Joseph Osai was had that kind of role. Remember Joseph Osai be dropping back in coverage? You're like, why the hell is Joseph Osai dropping back in coverage? He should always be rushing, rushing, Nothing going broke. upfield disrupted exactly and i feel like that about anthony hill and i feel like they're gonna start using that way so that's a really good uh comp i i actually cannot dispute that comp you might be right about that when anthony hill reaches what is close to his ceiling here at texas uh good question there i like that um all right uh, another question here for uh from uh cotton said is Vasek gonna see the field i fear if not he will portal despite the legacy uh, CJ, you've talked about this defense of this edge room, and you you love it. You think uh, that uh, physically it may be the most impressive room, just looking at the kind of physical group overall and just the, their frames overall. What are your thoughts about that? Are we that deep that a guy like Colton Vosick wouldn't be able to crack the rotation on the edge? I mean, it's interesting. It really is because you look at who you expect to be in that mold. You know, you return two starters from a year ago, Ethan Burke, Baron Sorrell. You don't anticipate them being out of the rotation, obviously. Then you go out and you add Trey Moore, a guy with 22 and a half sacks over the past two seasons, 14 and a half last year alone. He's probably your quickest, your twitchiest off the edge coming in. You probably picture him to be the third guy. Then you go out and you add five-star Colin Simmons, who I think we all anticipate being pound for pound, probably the most talented edge rusher Texas has had in recent history coming out of high school. So there's four. Now what steps does Jamon take? Uh, Jamon Tapp take this year? What about Justice Finkley? Two guys that are older than Colton Vosick and have seen the field before. Does Colton Vosick leapfrog them to get on the field? That's the big question. Because Vosick, again, his biggest question mark, as Burnt Orange Horn says right there, you know, he's got to stay healthy, right? You know, he's got to stay on the field. And if you can if you can rely on him to stay on the field, he's a hell of a player. I mean, at 6'6 six, six and a half, 255, 260, right in that range, his body looks tremendous. He's no longer that kind of lengthy, wiry guy that we saw at high school at Westlake. He's a guy that looks like he could play the edge in the, in the SEC. The question is, will he be able to use this spring to catapult the guys in front of him, the older guys? Because that's not the easiest thing to do. Um, Coach, I wanted to ask you, when when you look at these edge guys and you see the length, what's kind of the differentiator between guys that have it all, guys that might not have the length but have the twitch? Is it simply just getting to the quarterback, or is there a little bit more that goes in playing that edge spot that most most guys might not see? Yeah, there, there's no doubt there's things involved in this that, you know, the normal lay person doesn't see. You know, that first step is so important, you know, coming off the edge. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Vasek is a guy who who brings uh, overall some things we haven't seen in a while, you know, on the 40, honestly. But uh, 
you know, I, I, I think, you know, I look at guys coming off the edge. I look at the first step, you know, and see, you know, how explosive they are. And I, I certainly think he he fits that bill. He's a guy I'm really looking forward to seeing coming off the edge. Uh, it, it seems to be a little paranoia about the edge position. Rick here says uh, in the chat, uh, and he said, I have a feeling an edge leaves in the portal with Vosick's emergence on top of having Moore and Collins come in and both starters returning. Uh, it is very deep um, who might leave in the portal. So it seems like Lohan fans, uh, it, you know, it's, it's basically they're happy that the edge position is so deep um, that you have all this talent. But I guess now one of the downsides to that is that you understand in the transfer portal era, there will be attrition when you start stockpiling that kind of talent. And my man, David Keith Williams, shout out to uh, my man, DK, D, uh, DK Dove here. He always throws out interesting insight. And he also, I think, kind of expresses some of the Longhorn fans, maybe, uh, maybe paranoia, maybe anxiety. He said, what's your view about the likelihood of Texas recruiting so much talent and developing that talent all to remain behind better players on the depth chart and ultimately transferring away from Texas. So guys, are we, is this, some, is, is this something that is inevitable when you start in the transfer portal era with uh, the player empowerment era, where these guys have NIL opportunities, that being the law of the land as well, that Texas can only stockpile so much talent uh, and they're going to stockpile it. Trust me, they're going to turn it out and it's going to be everywhere, but they're gonna, they can only stockpile so much or, is the culture at Texas going to turn Texas into the outlier where guys are willing, like the running back position, to stay at Texas and develop like the offensive line right now? Where well, they're willing to stay at Texas and develop and almost wait their turn, which is something you just haven't heard of in college football in, uh, in decades. Could Texas be the outlier there or are they going to end up like almost everybody else seeing natural attrition after stockpiling so much. It's like more money, more problems kind of thing here. I, I tell you what I look at. I look at, I look at Manning. I see him waiting his turn patiently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Patiently waiting his turn. And I think when he finally gets his shot, he's going to be ready because, you know, he, he's, he's paid his dues. A lot of these guys, you know, they haven't really waited. They haven't really paid their dues. You know, they want to play as freshman or as redshirt freshman. You look at a guy like Manning and he is, you know, he, he's willing to sit for a year. He's willing to sit for another year. He comes in his third year. Most guys have given up by then, you know. Yeah. I, I see him being a guy who really encourages guys to stay. and He encourages guys to stay, work work through the uh, depth chart, and then when you finally get your shot, you know, you're going to get your shot. The NFL doesn't look at guys as three-year starters, four-year starters. You know, they go the last two years, and then they can have a really good idea of who's going to project as a starter in the NFL. Yeah. yeah. No, it is I, – I, I, sorry, go ahead, CJ. I want to hear what you're going to say. I mean, I, I think this is a good problem to have. You know, you yeah. don't – at Texas, you're recruiting good players. Just like, there's no question about it. Uh, if, if it comes to the point where good talent is leaving your program, but you continue to win, that just means that you're continuing to have better talent on roster. And I think that's encouraging. You know, Texas, I think this is the first year where you'll really see some guys – that maybe you wanted and hoped would stay at Texas for their duration of their career. Like you'll see some guys leave this, this spring that you thought, okay, man, like I, I would have liked to have seen him in the burnt orange this year. In previous years, I think it was guys that, you know what, maybe in a few years we'll know what he can do on the field. It won't be immediate. Now I think it, it, it's one of those things where you'll start seeing some of those immediate guys leave and, and, and it'll kind of be, Oh, you know, a little bit of an eye opener, but yeah. as we've talked about earlier, Texas has so much depth and so much talent at every position, essentially, except for that defensive line that I think you're going to be fine regardless of who leaves. Yeah. It's, yeah. No, I, I'm with you. The, the attrition is inevitable. Um, but, uh, you know, co as coach is right, there may be hope that Texas can be an outlier in a, res in, in a certain respect here, because in, we know Texas is a leader in the NIL space. 
Um, we know Texas, uh, you know, if Sark uh, has right, uh, the right game, the right blueprint here, and, and he can start developing players consistently like he has doing, he has done this past season into being NFL players, the players that the recruiting pitch will be easy for Texas to keep acquiring this, this top level talent. And you already have examples of guys waiting their turn, which have already, uh, I think, confused and, and stupefied college football fans like Arch Manning deciding to, to stay and wait his turn. Um, like, you know, Rojo deciding not to transfer when he could have been a starting running back somewhere. Like it, Jonathan Brooks, another example of that running back room. Guys went to turn. And then we've talked about the offensive line, how not a lot of those guys left. Now, as CJ mentioned, that could happen here in the, in, in the uh, near future, just because Texas does prove to have a lot of talent. And after spring, there will be some serious conversations. But maybe Texas in, in some positions, in some respect, can be an outlier where you can stockpile talent there and players will be willing if they know that they'll end up accomplishing their dreams by being patient, which is competing for championships and making it to the NFL. Then maybe you will get guys like Jonathan Brooks and guys like Arch Manning and guys like Rojo's like, no, no, I can still accomplish my dreams even if I'm patient and I, I wait my turn. That's what I think Texas, if there is a differentiator between Texas and other programs is one, Texas is going to take care of you. Obviously uh, I look back at CJ Baxter's quote in third and Longhorn where, you know, one of the differentiators in his recruitment when Texas started getting involved was, you know, he visited Texas and he saw how many, you know, former players and veterans stuck around the city. Yep. And that stood out to him. He said, you know, if you play for Texas, they're going to take care of you. And they're also, you know, they're going to want to stick around the program, which I'm not saying there's a lot of programs that don't have that. But for Texas in such a large city that's growing with so many opportunities, you're going to come across something that will pique your interest, kind of lure you in and keep you around the city that I think a lot of other programs and cities and campuses and, and, and really college towns don't provide right now. So that's another thing. Uh, but when you look at the guys who have kind of been the heartbeat of teams recently and the way that Texas fans kind of, you know, endear them, Jordan, Jordan Whittington, Roshan, uh, even Michael Dixon, who, you know, yeah, you're right. at a time, Texas fans loved him because mm -hmm. of what he did for the program and how, you know, they looked and grasped for any type of hope at the time. So it's unique in that sense, I think. Yeah, no, I agree with you. It is. And uh, hopefully that is the case that Texas can. Uh, I, re I still remember Malik Murphy and the comments he made when he left uh, yeah. that he, he was reluctant to leave. He's like, I don't want to leave, but I have to if I want to. I want to play right now, but I'm not willing to wait my turn anymore. Uh, but even he stayed around for a little bit. My man CB says, isn't attrition natural in a winning program? Plus, we haven't seen Texas this deep probably since Rod's senior year. Yeah, that they are. Yeah, I mean, they they are that deep where I think the attrition, kind of how CJ brought up, it's going to be almost good attrition where you're churning out guys who are going to be coveted by other power five universities when they decide to transfer from Texas and you're still going to be able to win and you still have guys who uh, are maybe even better players who have higher upside than the players who departed. So I, I'm with you, CB. Texas hadn't been this deep since the mid 2000s. This is the last time Texas was this deep, one to, to, to 85. How many guys they got out there? There's no doubt about it. Um, okay. I feel like, and Coach and I talked about this, CJ, I feel like one aspect of this team we have not discussed at all really is special teams. I don't feel like we're hype enough on special teams, and I feel like we should be. I feel yep. like special teams is going to be a weapon for Texas this season. Um, I, I And I know there may be regression in some areas. You did lose Ryan Sanborn. He was a, a hell of a punter. But, man, when you look at bringing back Burt Auburn, who since we, we talked about Burt Auburn earlier, might as well give him some props. I mean, Burt Auburn last year finished as, you know, first team all Big 12, first team all conference kicker. And that's, that, was, that was with a slow start. Uh, the coverage teams are going to be better just because from one through one through 80 plus, you're already a really more talented roster than you have been. And all those guys who are waiting their turn, who are not frontline stars and rotational players, they're going to be running down covering kicks. Um, and I think also when you start looking at the, the return game, there's a chance that Matthew Golden is an upgrade over Keelan Robinson, a kickoff return. And I predict that Silas Bolden is probably going to be your punt returner. I don't know that for a fact, but I predict it's probably going to be him. He, I don't know if he's as good as Xavier Worthy because Xavier Worthy was elite in that aspect. Um, but I don't know, Coach, I'll throw it to you first. Does it seem like um, we don't give enough props to special teams? I mean, that has been the most consistent 
phase uh, for Steve Sarkeesian football since he came on the 40 acres. Jeff Banks hadn't had a bad year yet. Yeah, that's right. Especially when you add Golden and Bolden. Golden and Bolden, baby. Golden and Bolden. In, in, into the return. I don't know which one. One has kicks, one has punts. Maybe one guy has both. Maybe they swap out. I'm not sure. But there's two guys that have a proven track record of, of being efficient, you know, in the returns. And I think our special teams coordinator has shown that he knows how to develop those guys. He, yeah. he knows how to get the blocking schemes together to help those guys be successful. And those are two guys that have proven where they came from if they know how to return the ball. And so I think those are two guys I'd look for in our return game. I think yeah. that's a good point. And, Rob, the other thing I wanted to touch on is not only are you potentially getting more talented football players out on the field in this special forces unit, but they're more athletic. And I think in special teams, that's really where you probably see athleticism kind of take advantage or kind of be more opportunistic than anywhere else on the field. And on top of that, it's a lot of guys who want to get on the field at Texas. You know, you, you have to earn your stripes, sort of say, through special teams at times. You go look at the running back spot. It started with Roshan Johnson. We saw it with Jonathan Brooks a little bit. Jaden Blue now making his, his mark. Hey, Trey Wisner wasn't going to see the field last year. And then he said, oh, let me uh, let me just go be the best kickoff or, or kickoff coverage guy I can possibly be. And he's become a fan favorite as a result. So uh, it's interesting because now you're adding guys who have flooded all-star games as a senior in high school. You know, Xavier Phil Simi, Jordan Johnson, Rubel, Wardell Mack, Kobe Black. All of these guys you anticipate being on special forces early in their year, all yeah. of which were Under Armour All-Americans or All-American Bowl guys. So it, it's just a wealth of talent. And this is one of those problems to have if you're Texas is – if you, how, how can you get all these guys on the field? Where here, here's one solution. Special no teams. doubt, totally agree. And I know the probably the one area of special teams that's most concerning is your punt coverage unit because you lost your two best gunners, uh, Keelan Robinson and Keaton Crawford, and you lost your punter. But like you just said, man, uh, CJ, you're gonna be able to replace those gunners with guys who are just overall have a higher upside and and they have a better athletic profile. Uh, they may not have the speed of those guys straight away, but they might be better overall football players. So I'm not, you know, I, I'm actually thinking that these special teams is not getting enough love. I think Jeff Banks, like he has done every year he's been there, is gonna is gonna knock it out of the park. Yeah, Matthew go to nine kickoff returns last season and two of them for touchdowns, averaging over 35 yards per kickoff return. And if you're a really good player and you're you're not obviously you're not gonna get drafted in the first or the second round, so you he's a guy that's gonna get drafted in the middle to the late rounds. Now, with the NFL changing the kickoff return rule uh, to the XFL hybrid kickoff return, you might want to ask Coach if you can go back there and return some kicks because it'll increase your draft stock now. It used back, I, I, I would say prior to the new change, I don't know if it helped you as much. Now it's going to help guys, man. Keelan Robinson is the best kickoff returner in this draft class. And he's going to, he's not going to get drafted, I don't think, but he's going to be a priority free agent for a team. I guarantee you. Uh, no doubt about that. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. So we'll see. But I think Texas return game is going to be pretty good. All right. Before uh, we got here, we'll take a few more questions. Uh, we got a couple of questions that I want to hit in the chat really quickly. And uh, we'll also if you got some more questions, throw them out there. But let us give a shout out to our sponsor just one more time. Uh, we really appreciate our friends over at Flat Creek Estate Wine for their support. Uh, they are raking in the awards, 11 of them in 30 days, folks, for Flat Creek Estate Wine, including Double Gold, Grand Reserve, and Texas Grand Reserve at the Houston Rodeo. Five-time award winner at the San Francisco International Wine Competition. Select bottles of the wines by Flat Creek Estate are now available at your local specs. Flat Creek Wines blend old world tradition with new world techniques to deliver you a wine experience you never thought possible. You're ready for a better wine. So head to your local specs or visit flatcreekestate.com to get your first taste of award-winning Flat Creek. That's flatcreekestate.com. And thank you very much for all of your support. And I guarantee you, I'm going to go check it out for myself. I've actually made, uh, I've actually told my wife about it. 
and we going to make it a priority to get out there to Flat Creek Estate Wine. I suggest you do the same. So thank you very much to a Flat Creek Estate Wine for all of their support. And that, that's uh, flatcreekestate.com. Just go to Flat Creek estate.com. All right. They also uh, do a lot of events out there. So if you got some big event, uh, wedding po- wedding party of some kind, uh, maybe birthday uh, dinner of some kind, some special anniversary, uh, Flat Creek Estate, also a great place to celebrate that as well. Uh, okay. So before gotta we get out, out got to go check it out, man. Got to go check. I, I, actually, my wife is big on going to uh, wineries. So I am trying to get some brownie points. I'm going to try to get that uh, get that set up as, as soon as possible. Uh, all right. Uh, Gamers Life. I like this uh, question here. First of all, Gamers Life says, I need help. <laughs> I live in Vegas, but wife just took a job in Tulsa over, over one in DFW. How is a Longhorn supposed to survive around all those Oki and Hog fans? Suggestions other than separate homes. Oh, man. Yeah, separate that, homes. That, that, pray, <laughs> brother, pray. <laughs> that is pricey, man. That's a, yeah. I feel bad for you. I feel yeah. That's tough. I've been I've been to Oklahoma a few times only for games to uh, play Oklahoma State. I've never been to Norman because we always meet them in Dallas. But I've been to Stillwater a couple of times, and I went to Okarchi, Oklahoma. Uh, I believe that's where it was. Cra- Craig Way and I went. It was Craig Way myself. Uh, Jeff Howe and uh, Roger Wallace. There was uh, there's a there's a I, I, I BS you not. It's in the middle of nowhere. All right, it's where the hills have like, middle of nowhere, and I think it's in Okarchi, Oklahoma. Go look it up. See if I'm wrong. It's called Aishin's Fried Chicken Bar in the middle of nowhere. I asked, I told my man Craig Way because Craig Way he knew we worked together for years, and Craig Way said, uh, "Man, I'm gonna take you to have some of the best fried chicken that I've ever had." Because me and Craig Way always vibe about going going out to eat at different places. And Craig said, man, I'm telling you, it's some of the best fried chicken I've ever had. It's in the middle of nowhere, though, in Oklahoma. And I was like, Craig, I'm not going to the middle of nowhere with you in Oklahoma just for some fried chicken. He's like, all right, when we go to visit Stillwater for, to play with Texas playing them, we'll go. So we went there and we drove out to this spot, dog, not joking, in the middle of nowhere. And we walk in and they serve three things on the menu, a Frito pie, hot dogs and fried chicken. It, come, it came in a tin pail, like an actual pail with a red and white paper in it. And when I, I ain't gonna lie, when I walked in, it was only one brother in there. And I walked in, and this, this is a true story. When I walked in, he looked at me and he walked out. <laughs> like, like there was an understanding or something, like there was a quota. He looked at me, he gave me the head nod. And he <laughs> and nod. Ask Craig Way is a true story. It really happened. So I go in there, I'm like, man, I don't know about this spot. I'm not BSing. It was it was like the third best fried chicken I've had in my life. It was amazing. It was not seasoned. It had no seasoning on it at all. It was just fresh yard bird. If you 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 bit into it, the juices would like flow down your your mouth. It was it, it was amazing. They they was killing. I'm telling you, they, they was killing them chickens out in the back. It was that fresh. They was ringing necks in the back, man. Them thing that thing was so fresh, and I had to bow down to my man Craig Way. He was right. That was some of the best fried till to this day. I'm still talking about it. That was years ago. I, I remember that fried chicken. So Gamer's Life, tell her if she is in Oklahoma, see if she can get to Okarchi, Oklahoma, get some of that Aishin's fried chicken out there. There you go. Boom. That's hilarious. That's yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, let's. Uh, uh, Gamer's Life did have a question, though, before we get out of here. What SEC team will be our newest rival? Tennessee, Battle of the UTs, Bama, History, Ole Miss, uh, coaches knowing each other, or someone else. Y'all got a thought as to who may be a, a I, gotta, I gotta get y'all's thoughts on something first. Who oh, who are Texas's rivals right now? Is it do you just have the two? Is Arkansas still considered? It, uh, oh, what are y'all yeah. y'all have been around longer than I have? Y'all have been a part of these games. As someone who growing up, I just missed the last 14 years of my life watching college football at Texas and Texas AM. I understand Oklahoma, I understand Texas AM. But is Arkansas still in that conversation from the Southwest Conference days? Uh, is LSU a new age guy from different sports? I want to hear from you guys first before we start thinking about who might be the new uh, the new age rivals here. You That's ask fair. anybody from Arkansas, anybody from Arkansas, <laughs> it's a big rival to them. Way yeah. bigger for them than it is for us. Coach, right. would you would you compare that to the Texas how Texas Tech in a way compared that themselves to Texas? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, possibly. Yeah, possibly. But um, that's way more on them than it is on us. Sure. I, I say for uh, for a rivalry that's that's equally um, probably uh, something that everybody looks at. I'm going to say a new rivalry that we need to look at, especially since our 2018 Sugar Bowl is Georgia. Ooh. I like that, well, Coach. You plan them back-to-back -back years, though, too. You're going to play them this season, and then you'll play them in 2025, yeah. too. And then you might play them, Coach. You might play them twice. If you get to the SEC title game, you play them again. And then there's a chance in the college football playoff, they both get there, you play them again. <laughs> hey, Rod, the way that that might shake out is exactly in those big situation games, you know, one that might determine the one or the two seed in the SEC. I wouldn't necessarily consider Clemson and Alabama a rival, but they played in enough meaningful games in the last yeah. 10 years that I'm starting to think, you know, there's some bad blood between the two. I mean, the stakes in which those teams played one another were so high and so heated. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure they wouldn't count each other as friends, you know, like yeah. uh, so that, that I mean, Georgia might just be that school for Texas to line up with moving forward. Of course, with that chapter one coming uh, this this uh, this this fall. I'm excited yeah. for that. That's a that's a good one, coach. I don't I don't mind that at all. Uh, the natural one, I guess, would be you know, kind of LSU because you're that's a neighboring state. I mean, you're right yep. there. Kind of like, like like Arkansas, like you're right there. Um, so that would be a natural one. Um, it's weird. I mean, because I know the Aggies, the Aggies want another, they, they, prior, they, they wanted to have their own rivalry, special rivalry, like Texas has with Oklahoma and it just didn't work out for them. They really could. They wanted that to be LSU, I believe, but LSU didn't necessarily believe that the Aggies were on their level. Exactly. And when it comes to your, when it comes to your rival, everybody wants to be out kicking their coverage. Right. Everybody wants their rival to be a football program as good or better than them. Right. So that's why Oklahoma fits. You can say what you want about Oklahoma in terms of being a football program. That's a damn good football program, man. It's, it's a top five one all time. So that's why Texas is fine with Oklahoma being their rival. And Aggies being Texas rival and then Texas Longhorns will accept that. But not as their main rival. They're the side piece. They're the side piece. And they didn't want to be the side chick anymore. They wanted to be the main thing. And Texas is like, no, our main thing is Oklahoma because that's a better football program. So it's interesting that how the rivalry thing works out. You can't really it pair is. them up. But they, 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 they do happen like you're right about that. If, if both programs seem to have really important uh, games, relevant games that matter uh, in, in multiple years, they do seem to spark up these uh, kind of temporary rivalries. So, so you will. So I, I think LSU might be the one I'm choosing. I wanted to float one out for y'all and also the chat. I wanted to hear the chat on this because, you know, for those on Twitter, you see the tweets all the time. You know the backstory with Steve Sarkeesian, Lane Kiffin, yeah. Ole Miss now playing with the big dogs in the SEC, coming off of a 10-win season. I know the question mark might be how many times they play one another. But yeah. That could be an interesting one. Lane yes, Kiffin and Steve Sarkeesian going back and forth with one another. I, I, I wouldn't hate that. I'd like that. Cause Lane is wild. Lane, Lane is quirky, man. You get your popcorn ready, right? Lane, Lane will talk some trash. Lane will say something crazy. Uh, Lane's pretty wild. So yeah, Lane's entertaining. So yes, I would be down with that. I would be on board with that. And yeah. tr trust me, have y'all been to the Grove? Have y'all been to Ole Miss and been to the Grove yet? Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. It's a that's that's a great place to go watch a football game, man. It really is. Um, so I wouldn't mind just going there just for a game. Um, we're gonna be saying that a lot though about the SEC. Uh, all right, uh, good uh, good discussion there, gentlemen. I think it's about time for us uh, to break it down here. Any closing thoughts for the championship winning drive, the winning championship drive, I should say, as goes back to the championship winning yeah, drive. I, I, I'd like I'd like to say one thing, and that is just because somebody considers us a rival doesn't always mean that they're in our top rivalry. You know. Yeah. Uh, like I said, Arkansas really uh, hates everything about us. Uh, we've got a few people uh, in front of them in the pecking order. You know, Oklahoma, a and maybe Arkansas. We'll, we'll see how they do. But, uh, you know, Arkansas, Alabama, Georgia, LSU, it's going to be a fun conference. It'll be fun to see who winds up being the real – 
rivals, you know, yeah. in this field. It's going to be really hard to to upstage uh, UT Oklahoma, UT A and M, and then I, I think you're battling for second, uh, for third and fourth place with uh, Georgia, Alabama, maybe even Ole Miss lately. But you know, Sark and um, you know Kiffin are they're pretty close. I, I don't know how. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how uh, rabid, I guess you could say, of a rivalry that will be, because I think Lane has a lot of respect uh, for Sark, and I think Sark has a lot of respect for Lane. I don't know if uh, where that will be in the pecking order of rivalries, but I think you know we need to get a couple of years into the SEC and see where all that uh, shakes out. Yeah, your uh, your your comment, coach, that a lot of people believe that they're Texas is rival, but Texas doesn't necessarily reciprocate that feeling. They don't necessarily believe that they are a rival of Texas. Uh, reminds me of what I used to say about uh, Dayton. It's a lot of women believe they date Rod B, but Rod B's only dated a few women. <laughs> and I, uh, I only dated a few, but they, a lot of women are like, oh, I dated Rod B. Like, yeah, I guess you did. Uh, you hey, did. if I got my Charlie Strong finger going. <laughs> you see that Charlie Strong finger going, huh? Coach, that was funny. That was how did you, how'd you do that? That that looked just like that Charlie Strong finger. <laughs> that dude had a two foot long finger in that picture, didn't he? That is great. Oh, that was a money. We got to end it on that note because we're gonna end on a high note. That was a fantastic job, there, Coach. I that was that. funny. Old school reference there. Uh, all right, folks, uh, like and subscribe uh, for more Longhorn coverage on Owen Texas football. Uh, CJ, you got any closing comments before we get out of here? Yeah, if you're watching on Twitter, make sure to head over to YouTube. Make sure to head over to ontexasfootball.com as well. Join the community. Uh, of course, recruiting updates, NFL draft updates, uh, spring ball updates all over there as well. Uh, spring practice number six tomorrow morning. Uh, as well as uh, Texas Relays updates and everything that goes along this weekend. Come join us. Uh, winning Drive will be back when, Rod. Tell the folks. Yeah, we're going to be back on Monday. Monday around 4.15 to 5.30. Uh, remember, Mondays and Thursdays. For now, uh, we might expand this thing depending on how much uh, love we get from you guys. And we appreciate the love that we get. Uh, so thank you guys for all the Super Chats. Thank you to my man Matthew behind the scenes as well. Thank you to Coach. Thank you to my man uh, CJ Vogel. Thank you to Flat Creek uh, Estate Winery. We appreciate their support as always. And yeah, it's starting to look like I'm in uh, the Blair Witch Project over here. So we got to get out of here. <laughs> Until next time, y'all. Hook them. <laughs>